How did you and David Freeman meet, and what brought you and David to write this book, All Electric America, together? So David and I met at an energy storage conference, and we both were talking about how we weren't moving fast enough towards transforming our energy infrastructure. And we, um, we, we were talking about how we have all of the technology we need to transform to an all-electric, all-renewable energy infrastructure, how it's actually an exciting future, how we have um, um, how it's a great resource and how even if there weren't climate change, we should want to move towards this technology. And we were talking about it and he, ha he called me up and said, do you want to write a book together so that we can write about it and let people know? And when we started writing the book, it was even less well known than it is today. And so I said, yeah, let's write a book. And, and that's how we, um, we decided to do it. What do you believe is our way forward in, in solving the climate crisis? I think that we will all need to do something. To make it happen, you'll need the effort of a lot of people and a lot of avenues. It's not going to just be one thing. You need our entrepreneurs to work on the technology. You need our teachers. You need our engineers. Uh, you need our lawmakers to pass laws. Laws are really very important. We're a civilized society. Um, we've passed laws in the past to fight fascism. World War II we went and we um, have civil rights laws. There are things the market can't do and I think passing uh, laws is helpful as well. And um, I think uh, um, what we need to do is continue to work to help um, get the 21st century te clean technologies implemented by um, developing them as entrepreneurs and engineers and also buying them in our homes, like buying uh, heating, um, heat pump heating, electric heating, or electric cooking in our homes, buying electric vehicles, and helping move this technology forward so that as it gets cheaper, as it um, uh, gets better, more and more will be implemented. Just like in 1985, we all got personal computers. And in some sense, we're in the phase where we're the, the, the solar and wind energy that we're installing is in the earlier phases. What we'll have in the year 2050 and 2030 is not what we have today. We're not, we're not working on DOS, you know, and, and our 1985 personal computer anymore. We, um, you know, now we have tons of um, computing power in our hands and that connects us to the world. So we have to start today and we have to work with the technology we have today. And saying we shouldn't do it is like saying, we shouldn't have used the personal computer in 1985 because the smartphone didn't exist. So I think we need to start using it and implementing it. Could you describe the collaboration process? So Dave and I, uh, we wrote different chapters for the book and we would get together. He lives in Washington, D.C. and near his, his children and who are, uh, he's 93 years old and uh, I live, he's now 93. I live in Portland, Oregon and we would um, uh, meet in different places. If he, he had visited a friend in Hawaii and I came up, he was flying through Seattle, we would meet, we would talk about it, brainstorm, put the book together, and then we would decide on different chapters to write. <clears throat> I would write a chapter, he would write a chapter, and then we would um, switch chapters, give each other's chapters, and work on each other's chapters, edit them, and then send them back to each other, and then talk about it and argue over whether what our, we changed should be changed and how to do it is how we, how we worked on it. So it was interesting that we were able to work uh, together on this, in this process um, as technology was evolving, as time was moving forward, as different um, political events were happening, uh, we would get together and continue to um, massage each chapter like that. And then um, uh, it was definitely true that uh, we could, with modern technology, be able to collaborate across the country. And it was really kind of um, um, exciting to see that. When you describe an all-electric future in your book, what are you referring to? So what I'm referring to is that when you move to an all-renewable energy infrastructure, you will be moving ultimately to a clean um, electric infrastructure because our energy will be fueled with electricity. So 
if we're going to run our cars, we're no longer going to run them on oil, we'll be running them on electricity. If we're powering our homes with heat pumps instead of uh, natural gas furnaces, we'll be, we'll be running them with electricity. And so we're calling it all electric because so much of our, of our, um, our energy infrastructure now will be fueled by electricity. And so um, the reference to all electric is also a reference to the all electric home in the 1950s that the utilities were trying to promote electrification and they're trying to bring uh, electricity to a million rural homes in, in the United States. And um, <clears throat> it was actually uh, Dave's idea to call it All Electric America because he, re he's, he was born um, in 1926, I believe. So he was an adult when the All Electric Home concept um, was, you know, was um, being pushed by the utilities. And the utilities, a number of utilities, uh, ended up collaborating with um, uh, companies and they one of Whirlpool, Westinghouse, and um, GE, and Ronald Reagan was the spokesman, and they were pushing the all-electric home. And it was a time when the utilities were actually promoting their product, and and now is a time also to start moving to an all-electric future, um, in an all-electric, all-renewable future. Now we will also we could have hydrogen as well, and hydrogen can be be produced with electricity as well electrolytically, where you split water to make hydrogen, then you can make hydrogen airplane, um, have hydrogen airplanes or ships or cars or um, hydrogen storage as well. So it's still relating to electricity. Is an all renewable energy infrastructure possible? It is possible. We have all of the technology and we have enough resources many times over to do it. There's been some discussion about whether um, solar panels and wind could do it, but we have about 18 times the um, uh, energy just from solar PV in rural areas alone um, that, I mean, we have the capacity to do that. We have the land and we can develop it on land that isn't pristine and isn't going to hurt um, um, vulnerable species of any type, um, plants or animals. And um, we have about two and a half times or more wind capacity um, that we would need to, uh, to power all of our energy needs in 2050 as well. So. That's just with rural PV and with wind. We have other technologies, um, geothermal and wind and wa I mean wave and what have you. So we have that and um, we also have enough. It, it's not going to take up as much land as, as many folks say it would take up. We, it's about 0.2% of U.S. land if you don't count spacing. If you count spacing, it's about 1.4% of U.S. land. And then we also have digital technology since it's distributed and distributed and um, variable, variable, and you would need energy storage to help with the balancing. Uh, our computing technology can manage all of that. We, we have no problem. Can natural gas be considered a bridge fuel, and does switching from coal to natural gas reduce greenhouse gases? Uh, so natural gas really isn't a bridge fuel. I mean, in some sense, we are still using natural gas, but we need to take our fossil fuel infrastructure offline by about 4% or 6%, uh, um, if we really want to be safe, 6% each year. And we need to take natural gas offline as well, all fossil fuels. So we need to reduce all emissions by 6% a year, and then we need to be putting renewable energy online. And um, natural gas, although folks say it's clean, it produces carbon dioxide. And it also there's also methane that leaks from the infrastructure. But we need to get to zero emissions. So even if there's no leaking, you still produce carbon dioxide. It produces half of the carbon dioxide as coal when it's burned, but it still produces it, so it should come offline. The other problem is with methane leaking. Methane is 120 times more warming than um, carbon dioxide, and methane is really dangerous. I mean, it's right now we need to control the warming from happening in the short term and so the methane that leaks is very powerful towards warming so it it's we can't quite say okay well let's take natural gas off later and get all the coal off because of of the impact of the methane as well so it does need to come off and it shouldn't be a bridge even though 
we are using it. We're going to continue using natural gas as we continue to take it offline. So in that sense, it's already being used as a, a bridge to it. In some sense, all of our, the coal is, as well is being used until we can take it all offline. So for those people that are saying natural gas is burning clean, it's really, it's still emitting CO2. It's still a greenhouse gas and it's still, it's still emitting greenhouse gases and the International Panel of Climate Control came out with a study saying we need to keep our warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And to do that, we have to get to zero emissions. So that means we have to get off natural gas too. So it may not be producing the particulate matter that coal is producing where we can see the dirt in the sky and maybe it produces half of the carbon dioxide, but it's still. The lesser of two evils. Yeah, sort of, except for with the methane, it's actually worse, it can be worse, right? As bad or worse, depending.